In this video, I want to talk to you about one-star book reviews of classic books and the disturbing insight it gives into us as modern readers. Now, I don't know if you've ever read the one-star reviews in Amazon when you're looking at a book or in Goodreads if you go over there. One-star reviews are notoriously harsh and opinionated, as they should be. Um, they are extremely funny as well. And that's why you'll see a lot of YouTube, um, booktube creators making videos like my reaction to one-star reviews of my favourite book. And I was thinking I might do something the same, but as I started reading these one-star reviews more carefully, something much more interesting and insightful came to the surface. You see, while one-star reviews can be funny and can be strident, they often reveal more about the person as a reader than just their opinion. And it's that that I want to go into. So to give you some examples of these book reviews, take a look at these. About Pride and Prejudice, the moral of the story seems to be that enough money can make even the most abrasive and obnoxious jerk seem like Prince Charming. A reviewer of Crime and Punishment says, the story is dull and doesn't seem to go anywhere. And to make matters worse, it's very repetitive. Another reviewer says of Great Expectations, the book is spectacularly dull. It's inane, directionless, confused, dreary, circumlocutory, and self-indulgent. So that's some quite in-your-face, punch-you-on-the-end-of-the-nose comments about some classic books. Now, what I'm not going to say in this video is that you can't give a classic book a one-star review, that you have to enjoy all classic books. That's nonsense. I've got a video on 10 classic books I really don't like. There's nothing wrong with disliking them, but these kind of one-star reviews beg a question. How are we being taught to read and engage with literature? Because it's not only opinion in these reviews, there's also a revealing of the reasons for the opinion, the way that a book is being judged. So the problem that I really think starts within the education system itself. Let's face it, literature is often taught as a chore to get done rather than an exploration of something. Literature is an entry into the world of the inner person or the world at large and how it works and how we interact with it or into the minds of other people and how they think. But normally we're told, remember these key plot points, um, memorize these particular phrases um, and then regurgitate them on command whenever you get a test. That's not how to approach literature. And of course, it gives the wrong idea of literature. But let's break it down further and see what we can find from these reviews that seem to keep reoccurring, that show an error in approach. So there's three recurrent ideas that come up in um, the one-star reviews of classic literature. The first is entertainment over depth. Now, obviously, we read to be entertained quite a lot, but that's not the sole purpose of literature and a lot of the classics. You know, one of the things that's often said about classics is it's so boring, it's so slow to get to the point, it takes too long to observe different things. Well, the purpose of literature isn't just to get a quick fix of excitement. We live in a world that's very fast paced and wants instant gratification and likes being touched on the most obvious of emotions and senses. But classic literature is not a TikTok. Classic literature is not a YouTube short. It's not meant to be a Marvel film. Classic literature, and by this we don't just mean books and stories, is designed to make a person reflect, to think about something that happens in everyday life, your life, my life, lives through all history, to maybe shine a light on a particular pattern of behavior that's going on in society and to question whether we should carry on that way or what its downfalls are or what maybe it could be a big idea and would this be a better way to live? Could just be personal individual qualities 
And that's the idea. The key word is reflect. Reflection requires thought, considered approach. And that's what classic literature does. So a lot of the one star reviews, they go in and say, it's not fast paced enough. I don't feel I'm sucked in. There's no drama. Well, if we approach books and think that's what they are for, then no wonder we'll give a one star review to a lot of the classics. A second recurrent theme that keeps coming up in these one star reviews is a, a lack of understanding of the author's intent. Again, this may come from the fact that literature is just taught as a book you do in order to go to a test rather than an exploration. So of Crime and Punishment, it's sometimes said that, you know, Dostoevsky seems, you know, wrapped up in himself and he's very repetitive and he's long-winded and he won't get to the point. And he keeps going over the same thing. Well, that is true. But think about what Dostoevsky was trying to do in Crime and Punishment. He's trying to get you and me to tussle with feelings of conscience. Rashkolnikov in the book has killed a person. Now, he's then being hunted down. People are looking for the killer. How many times would you or I, if we were in that situation, go over and over and over our feelings, go over the scene, wonder whether we were spotted and caught? Dostoevsky wants to explore the psyche, the psychological damage and trauma that we go through because of certain ones of our actions. He also has the intent of exploring a particular idea, which is, is it wrong to do a bad thing to one person if it benefits a multitude of other people? This is a strong idea in its time and it still exists. You can't go through that thinking of a plot and excitement and twists and turns when the author's intent isn't that, but it's to get you to really hold one thing. Put it in your mind and see how it feels and to judge it based on your character. So that's the second thing that keeps coming up, a failure to understand author's intent. Now, the third thing that keeps cropping up um, in these one-star reviews is surface reading just taking a book at surface value. So we mentioned one earlier, didn't we, about you know the lesson from Pride and Prejudice is that if you've got enough money, you can be a jerk, but you'll still win the girl. Well, think of the thinking that goes into that comment. It shows a, only a surface level reading of Pride and Prejudice, doesn't it? What's seen is Elizabeth meets Darcy. Elizabeth doesn't like Darcy. Elizabeth finds out Darcy is rich. Elizabeth likes Darcy. Therefore, the moral is, if you're rich, the girl will eventually come for you, even if you're a jerk. But if you've read the book carefully, even just a little bit beneath the surface, you'll know that that's absolutely not the purpose of the book. That's literally just seeing the little signposts, you know, memorizing plot points, and then saying, so that's what the book's about. And this keeps coming up and it does make us think, how is it being taught? How is literature actually being taught in school? So let's take a look at some of the errors that maybe we've got in the education system or if we're homeschoolers, how we teach our kids or even if we're teaching ourselves. So the first one is teaching literature as homework and not as enjoyment or an exploration. I mean, how often, I remember it myself, did you hear your teacher say, um, now make sure that you jot this down because it's going to come up in the test and make sure you explain uh, this character in this way because that will get you um, a bump up in your grades. And you fill the book with things that you are supposed to say rather than exploring the book seeing how it relates to you. And this fundamentally comes down to how are we told to understand what literature is? It normally just becomes a book and a story. And that leads to the idea that stories are to entertain. And then if things are slow, throw them out. You know, they must be rubbish. That's the first problem. Teaching literature is homework rather than an exploration and enjoyment of yourself and the world around you and the deeper things that make up life, which do really 
touch us when we let them. The second aspect that gets in the way of um, understanding or appreciating literature and builds these kind of reviews is this overemphasis that's quite common on making the story relevant to modern times. Now, what I'm not saying is that classic books aren't relevant because they last because their themes are universal and infinite. You know, people today still focus on the same things, don't they? They want money, they want power, they want fame, uh, they want love and romance, and then they have all different vices and virtues. Go back through all of history and you'll find every age that's been the leading motivator for everybody. And so those things don't change. But what I'm talking about with this overemphasis, it's trying to see everything you read through the lens of today. So for instance, Pride and Prejudice, I've often seen in the one star reviews, it talked about as a piece of misogyny, it's a misogynistic work. But hang on a minute. We're viewing it through a particular lens. I would say that lens is actually a hairbreadth in width um, because Jane Austen herself was a very intelligent woman and championed women. What was her intent? Now you see how if we're taught just to see it immediately, right, we're going to read this book and we need to recognize that what's going on is the oppression of women, et cetera, et cetera. Now that is a discussion, but that's not what Jane Austen was talking about. Neither is it remotely related to the book. So this overemphasis, and you could pick any topic and, and go down that route. This overemphasis on interpreting everything from your standpoint as if we already know everything and we're looking back sneeringly at a classic is going to give you a negative impression. So when you read books like that, you're going to give them one star, but it actually shows that literature has been taught in the wrong way. The third thing that is a failure in the education system. And by that, I don't mean individual teachers. Some teachers are phenomenal teachers, but they're bound by the structure of the education system, often the grade system, and they're racing against the clock. But critical reading skills, not simply looking at how a plot develops. Plot is very much that's very much for the entertainment side of things. If you want to keep a fast paced movement, like a Wilkie Collins, for instance. Um, but the critical reading skills teach you to go underneath and they educate you in life, which is what literature is supposed to be a replication of. Because take, for instance, The Grapes of Wrath, which I know is studied in America. You could just look at the Joad family and oh, it's terrible, the depression and everything like that. But how about asking other questions. Would you have stayed? What would be the benefit of staying? Is industrialization a good thing? Because it's not being portrayed as a good thing here, but is the narrative too extreme? Or what about Charles Dickens' Great Expectations with Pip? How about asking questions like, what motivation has Uncle Pumblechew got in his life? What's the driving focus in his mind of what life should be. Of course, it's money. What about Mr. Wopsle? Why is Jaggers, who is a powerful man, doesn't seem happy? What is it in his personality that stops that? What is Dickens saying through Miss Havisham? What's she motivated by? Have you ever felt the same on a smaller scale? Who's the happiest person in the book? What is the purpose of Wemmick in his foolish castle-shaped house with his old grandfather who's deaf? Do you see, just asking questions, and maybe then asking, have you ever felt the same, takes you from the story down underneath, and you suddenly find that literature is this rich exploration of what drives us as human beings, and it actually helps us filter out negative motivators which we may be using day to day, but this is just high, put a magnifying glass on them. And then you discover yourself and literature starts becoming this wonderful thing. So when someone says about great expectations, it's one star because it's dull, directionless, inane, circumlocutory and self-indulgent. I don't mind the person having the opinion, I didn't like this book and I give it one star. But those comments, reveal their reason for not liking it. And those reasons betray a misunderstanding 
of what a book is meant to be in this case, literature. So those were the three main things. So how do we go about, or what would I say um, would be a better way to introduce people to literature? Well, again, I'm going to quickly go through three things. The first thing I would suggest, perhaps, um, when teaching literature, um, maybe at school level, or if you're getting into it yourself, is to learn the context. Learn the context of the time, because that influences the author's intent. It also influences, if we're not careful, we judge it from our standpoint and our social mores and social values, which aren't necessarily correct. Um, and we judge the past by them. But context, so Pride and Prejudice, you could just see it as the basic story, but find out what the situation was, the strata of society, how things operated and why they operated, and then find, you'll discover, that Jane Austen is satirising a lot of the social constructs. In fact, it's observations like hers that eventually lead on to the place we've got today, but it's much more personal. And rather than just knowing what we think today, coming to a conclusion ourselves. The second thing for engaging in literature that I would recommend is discussion over answers. Like I said, I'd love to see the comment, this will be in the test, binned, right? As long as there's a grade system, it will always have to be there. But discussion over answers. When we read a book, often the mistake is we're looking for the moral. But not all books have a moral. Crime and Punishment is, is um, an example of that. The original ending leaves you dangling in midair. And when you, if you ever come to my Patreon um, site, we read a book a month and then there's a group discussion at the end of the month. Now, some people might expect that I'm going to share, you know, what the book is all about. It's not, it's a discussion. There's a challenge of opinions that go on um, in a calm, and reasonable way. There's a looking and finding out what lessons can be teased out or what is the author thinking or how does this re, you know, cast a different shadow on maybe something we already just took for granted. Focusing on things like that makes literature come alive and it requires you to slow down and you begin to enjoy the fact that literature is slowed down. Another thing would be to use varying styles. So comparing works. Now, it may be a bit hard to have two big novels, but I'll use an example. Let's say we've got Pride and Prejudice. How about reading Jane Eyre um, and not judging which one is better, which one's best? Because that promotes the oversimplification of, I like this book, therefore it is good. I don't like this book, therefore it is a bad book. Jane Eyre and Jane Austen, uh, Charlotte Bronte and Jane Austen are frequently compared to each other um, for the negative or the positive. But how about just saying, how are their styles different? How does that make you feel? Does it give you another pair of shoes to walk in? How does it affect the way you think and the way you begin to reason things? So that's another great way of um, bringing people to literature. Not to think in terms of, I like it or I don't like it, but why are they working like they do? Why am I drawn to a particular style over others? So here's the key takeaway from this short video. It's that one star reviews don't simply reflect personal preferences. They actually reveal how we engage and read literature. In fact, what we think literature is meant to be. And if we're only taught to look for entertainment, or if we're only taught to look for plot points and talking points and hyper-modern relevance, then we're being taught to miss the majority of literature. In fact, no wonder it then becomes a chore to read it, because it's actually much deeper and wants you to slow down. Now, that's not to say that you have to enjoy every classic. You know, I can see people who haven't got this far writing in the comment section, oh, it's only someone's opinion, or you're a snob because you think every classic is five stars. No, I've got a video on 10 classics that I really don't like, and there could have been a lot more. However, when approaching a classic, we need to remember various things about how to approach it. 
Are we judging it by a simple, narrow criteria? Or are we open to come to it with a bit of humility and respect? And to think, what is the author trying to do? Why has it been slowed down? Do we want to just race through because we think a book is just a quick tale to experience? Or is it something that we're going to explore ourselves through? So the next time that you come across a one-star review, and I would say of any book, but especially the classics, ask yourself this simple question. Is this review simply a representation of what the book is? Or is it actually an insight into the way we've been taught to read? If you want to go further into this topic, I want to just share this last thing with you. I've kept this very overview of the discussion um, because it just came to me while doing my own research and looking into one star reviews. But if you want to go deeper, go over to my Patreon um, site. I'll put the link below. And even if you don't want to go on the paid membership, sign up for the free because I'm going to release another video there where I go through systematically a whole bunch of book reviews, which are one star. And from my perspective, I'll break down where I think they go wrong and, and where there's errors in thinking about what literature is from my personal viewpoint. If that's something that sounds interesting to you, and believe me, it's a good exercise because it challenges us. You may think, oh, that's how I think, but maybe there is another way to think, then by all means come over, sign up to the free part of my Patreon because that video will be coming up soon. The reason I don't put it on YouTube is because, well, it's a lot of people will just click on and click off. I want this for people who really want to get into literature. So until the next time, I wish you joy in whatever you're reading and reviewing.